Welcome to the Light Skins Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Ramirez, or Mediator. Um, this is episode two of the podcast. We appreciate all the support from the last one. Um, but anyway, let's get into our stars of the show. Oh, today is March 18th, 2024. Let's get into the stars of the show. Um, go ahead. Ryan Bevins here, also known as IB. Thank you for all the support on episode one and excited to be here for episode two. What's up? It's Brian Valdez. Excited to be here for episode two. I uh, appreciate the support and let's get into it. All right, then, let's get into it. LeBron hit 40K recently. Uh, actually, let me get the date. It was March 2nd, right? March 2nd, I believe. Uh, he, he, he hit his 40,000 against the Nuggets. Uh, I was actually fortunate enough to be at that game. It was a it was a it was a good game. Didn't end up in a win, but it was it was quite a moment. Um, I'm wondering for you guys, does this? It, it, it's it's really nice to see, um, but does this kind of move the needle for you guys in terms of the goat Le- debate when it comes to LeBron? Because I know, I know that his his kind of argument is longevity. And so I'm wondering if you guys, uh, if that if that just moves the needle, really. Um, and it's just really in terms of Jordan. Uh, let's go ahead and let's kick it off with Bryant. And, um, yeah, because I know you you got some words on LeBron probably, Bryant. Let's go ahead. Um, in my opinion, no. I think I still have him top five. I don't, like, the accolade is nice, but it's just, it doesn't move anything for me because it's not – it's not a ring, you know. It's not like an award. It's just an accolade. It's a stat. Like when Karl Malone had like the all-time – when he was all the all-time leading scorer, no one made a big fuss about him. When Kareem did it, he wasn't considered the GOAT. So why should we consider LeBron the GOAT? His accolades are more so just a longevity award, like you stated. So I don't really – it doesn't really do anything for me unless he wins a ring. That's like the only way I'll move him. Close, closest to the goat. So, to me, not not really. And it's a great stat. It's a great, great um thing to accomplish. But to me, it's not really anything you know to go crazy about. I mean, yeah, and that's my opinion. Though, what about you, Ryan? Coming from you. Oh God. <laughs> okay. I okay. You know what? I I don't know why I get surprised when I hear it. <laughs> Like these types of things coming from you, but I am surprised every time because for me, it doesn't move the needle because I hold Braun in that echelon of one or two. Like if somebody said LeBron was first overall over Jordan, I wouldn't argue with them. If they had said he was two behind Jordan, I wouldn't argue with them because I have him either one or two. So for that reason, the accolade doesn't do much for me. But for somebody who barely has him in the top five, and the dude has eclipsed 40,000. He has a 40, 10, and 10 career. 40,000 points, 10, bo- 10 boards, or 10,000 boards, 10,000 assists. And you're just like, oh, just another Sunday. <laughs> Seriously? Uh, I call LeBron the gestope. The greatest stat pattern of all time. He's a stat pattern. Also, to say that when Kareem hit the all-time record or set the all-time milestone, nobody viewed him as the GOAT, I don't think that was true because he hit that before Jordan. Obviously, we weren't alive at the time, so we don't really know the exact discourse, but I would assume when he hit that, it was in the 80s before Jordan was even established and it was well after Wilt's prime so I would assume that once he had won four or five rings I think he might have won a sixth ring already and then he established himself as the all-time scoring leader I would assume that people would give him that crown as the greatest of all time at the time could be wrong but I think it would be viewed as quite an accomplishment Um, and then once LeBron hits the all-time record himself, it was quite an accomplishment. So I don't think 40K is as much of an accomplishment or something to celebrate as 
like best than Kareem, the 40K is kind of just a cherry on the top. Yeah. But like I said, since I already had him one or two, it doesn't really move the needle for me. But getting back to my original point, directing it at somebody who has Braun only in the top five, I would I would think you would hold a 40K in a higher light. But typical Brian. I have, so I have him in my top four. Okay. So, yeah, I, oh, oh. I wanted to – that's what I was going to ask. Uh, I was kind of waiting for it to wrap up, but – this is a question for you, Bryant. Mm-hmm. Where it where so he's top four. He's number four. Can yeah. I hear your top five? And to, to a further question on that would be, let's 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 go away from the goat because he's not your goat. He's not number two. Does forty k move him from five to four or four to three, wherever it is for you? Who does it move him past your three or four man? No, I mean I. I... I had him four by like before he even hit forty k. So to me, it was, yeah, I had him four. I had him five but like last year, but I moved him. I moved him um, down to four. And Who my, is your top five? Uh, Jordan, Kareem, Kobe, and then Braun, and then Magic. All right. Yeah, the Kobe <laughs> one is basically because I I I, don't know, I watch. I, I watched him more so than LeBron when I was younger, so I, I got to watch more of him. So, yeah. yeah, Kobe introduced I think all of us to basketball, being LA kids and yeah. I have a I have a question, a little back and forth for Brian. Uh oh. Um, so you mentioned that the only thing that can move the needle or that can move Bron up a peg in your all time ranking is a ring, yeah. correct? So any individual accomplishment he has at this point in his career where the motherfucker is damn near pushing 40, it has no impact on your standing of him whatsoever? Uh, I mean, if he won the MVP or something like that, maybe, but that's like that's not really doing anything for me because it's like, to me... This man is 40, and you are asking him to move Earth, <laughs> Mars, and everything just to move up in the standings? <laughs> This man has to do what very few people have ever done in their careers at damn near at the age of 40 mm-hmm. to move up in the ranking. I mean, that's all. And this is, not a, this is not a ranking thing for me, but let's think back of when Kobe's last game, he scored 60, right? It's Kobe fans, and they're Kobe fans. They're similar to LeBron fans and Jordan fans, but they will hold that to their argument as well it's like bro in his last game motherfucker dropped 60 in a win you know what i mean like there's a point of how old you are and how good you can still play you know what i mean and kobe couldn't do that for the longevity lebron could but i understand you it's it's very difficult you know what i mean the last game bro can't even walk you know (laughs) if kobe the reason why that was because Kobe had injuries back to back back. Well, back. yeah, that, but the, there's a point of well, LeBron is he's still he's still tugging like he was in he's in Miami, not at the explosiveness, but if you're looking at numbers, yeah, yeah. it's it's an accomplishment. Oh yeah, it's a nice one. It's a nice one, he says. <laughs> okay, I don't have I don't have anything else to say, but okay. Um... We'll we'll come back to the the Lakers, um, or not the the Lake LeBron and the Lakers, but let's move on. Uh, the next topic we're gonna get into it's gonna be the the Celtics, and uh, they've they they are they are one they if not the strongest team the second strongest team in the league probably on paper, um, but they have not been closing fourth quarter wise. Maybe it's Tatum, um, but ideally they should. They should be the fourth quarter team to beat because, you know, every one of them can get buckets. But um, let's go in. Let's get into it. They were just uh, they were just playing against the Cavs. They were up 20, choked in the fourth quarter. Um, Are we concerned about the Celtics? Do they are they still contenders for you guys? Because I'm pretty sure both of you guys said they're contenders. If not, I'd be surprised. But I do. um, Yeah, like they're contenders. Come on. But d- does this change where you are for them, or, or what? Let's uh, let's go into 
Let's start off with Ryan. Bryant, you said they were pretenders for yeah, you. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And- Crazy. Um, still, though, I have the I have them as contenders. At the time of the first episode, I had them as contenders, and I was pretty emphatic about that. And I even had them as a more likely team to win the championship than Denver. And obviously, since then, the collapse against the Cavs has happened. And when they went head to head, Denver came out on top, and mm-hmm. Jokic proved why the Nuggets should still be the team to beat that being said the blown lead is it a concern for me to a degree obviously you want your MVP caliber player your leader your team to really take over games and and put teams to bed and and not allow teams to have a chance to come back because that's more important in high pressure games like the playoffs whether it's the first round or the finals you need your your top guys to close the deal but I'm not going to sit here and completely throw out the rest of their schedule, the rest of their season, because for the most part of their season, they've been completely unfuckwithable. They have mm-hmm. by far look like the best team, top five in offense and defensive rating, a net rating of 11.7. The next closest team is OKC at 7.6. So on paper, this team is in a, in a tier of its own. They're on pace for 60 wins, and honestly, the only, the actually, there are two things that I was concerned about with this team due to kind of just nitpicking. It was their bench and their tendency to kind of chuck up threes, and their bench has actually gotten better as the season has progressed. I think Sam Hauser is getting a lot more opportunities. He's had a couple games where he's had around five or six threes, in a game and it's kind of served as a spark plug for them and it's kind of been needed because they've been looking for that piece outside of Al Horford coming off the bench somebody that can be a reliable source of offense I wouldn't I won't say Sam Howell's instant offense but he has kind of been a factor somebody that the defense has had to pay attention to outside of their top three in Porzingis Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum it's kind of just been a, a pleasant surprise and that's something I think they've been looking for throughout the season, and they found it in Sam Hauser. And I think this is a perfect time for them to find that as they go into the playoffs. So the close the closeout game thing, it's partly on Tatum. I think a lot of it's on Missoula, but I think they can figure it out before April comes around. And honestly, I, I can't just throw out what they've done for the other, what, 60 games that they've played. So... I'm not too concerned about the blown lead. It happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? <laughs> when, that can, when that lead disappeared, man, I was happy. I ain't going to lie. I mean, <laughs> I was just chilling on my bed with my feet up, just chilling with a cigarette in my mouth because I felt so – I felt like no Shadamas. But, again, it's not like the first time the Cavs have done this. I mean, earlier in the se- I mean, the Celtics have done this. I mean, earlier in the season when the Lakers came to town, uh, the Lakers beat them without AD and LeBron. Mm-hmm. I-, I-, I take that in consideration. It's not that they're not a good team because they are. And one of the reasons why I say the contenders uh, pretenders is because they don't know how to close out games. When the offense gets stagnant, they just chuck up a lot of threes. And Joe Mazzulia, Joe Mazzulia, isn't that kind of he? He's a good coach, but he's a he's an Ime Adoka. So I mean, last year when they were going against the Heat in the playoffs, the defense or oh, the offense got stagnant and they kept shooting threes. I mm-hmm. actually watched Game Seven last uh, last night, and one thing I noticed about the Celtics was they couldn't get to their own they couldn't get to their own plays. So they would just, that would just force them to take contested bad threes. And even with the improvement that Jalen Brown has been playing, he's been balling out. After the All Star break, I still don't see this team as a contender at all. I mean, they're they're a great team. I, I can see them making it past the first round, but at all. <laughs> but oh my god! But I mean, I I just got they're go in my, the East, right? Well, I know the East is the East is a it's a good it's a good, but it's not like it's not like the West. You know? That's what I'm saying. They, I think they can get a little further than a first round. <laughs> well, no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hold on. Let me 
So the Celtics are the first seed right now. The eighth seed is the 76ers. Okay, so they probably beat the 76ers. If the, play- if we- if the playoffs end today, they probably beat the 76ers. Will they beat the Heat in the seventh seed? I don't know. So, oh, I- wow. I-, I, guess, uh, but- I think they have the Heat. I think, the- I think the Knicks this is where insane. it gets scary. I think the Heat are their This the- is crazy. The Heat are their kryptonite. Let's not forget what happened last year. And even the previous year before that, when they forced into Game Seven, so I, I for me, they're still con- uh, pretenders. I don't trust the offense in the half court. Mm. Um, they're in the fast break; they're really good, but half court, the offense gets stagnant because they got two ball dominant players in Tatum and Brown, and they still have the free Porzingis, which he's been playing gr- great this season. But I just don't see him. Making the like a, a finals run, no, I, I don't see them. I don't even see them to be honest. If I'm being honest with you, I don't see them going to the finals within the next two or three years. So, but yeah, I understand. I understand you having concerns because these are concerns that I'm echoing as well. Like I've harped on their tendency to chuck up threes yeah. and, and settle, especially the Jays, Tatum and, and Brown, when I feel like they have a lot of opportunities to get to the rim and get a good lane to the rim or go to the free throw line because it's kind of hard to stop them when they get downhill <laughs> momentum. But concerns are one thing. To just say, flat out say that the number one offense and number two defense is not a contender and can barely make it to the second round is asinine to me. Like they have a... How many games into the season are we? Like 60 or so? Six. They have a 60-game sample size of being by far the best team in the league. Obviously, from game to game, they've had a couple a couple games where you're like, ah, uh, they, they look a little iffy. But every team has those throughout the season. We can't just... Sample size exists for a reason. Mm. And we can't just throw out the sample. They're on pace for 60-plus wins, Bryant. 60-plus wins. You know what? This reminds me of when the Dallas Mavericks lost to the Golden State Warriors in 2007 season. You know... I don't know. I mean, but you act like that's something that is predictable. That I, happened in what two thousand eight? Two thousand eight. I think six. I'm not sure, but yeah. Exactly. That's these are anomalies. Anomalies can't be predicted. They happen at a we'll just say fifteen or so, fifteen or so year interval. Like that's not something that you can rely on. As in my opinion as evidence to support your claim that they are not contenders. You can say they're susceptible or there are concerns, but just to flat out say that they are are not contenders and you're just predicting their downfall to a an underdog that really isn't an underdog in the Miami Heat because we're kind of expecting them or teams around the league are kind of ready for them in the playoffs. Like, I don't know. It seems kind of asinine. No, nah, I, I get where you I get where you're coming from. I guess I can see why others would see that, but I'm just going based off the couple, like just the previous years they've been in the playoffs. Besides, like the finals year when they came up short, they haven't. They always fallen like prior to that. So I just going based off what I've seen. So I, I I know this team is good. I'm not saying they can go to the finals, but I don't think they will go to the finals. That's my point. Uh, would I be surprised? I mean, a little bit, but it wouldn't be like a shocker to me. I'm just saying, like, I don't have them as a contender this year. Like I said, maybe. Can I ask you as who is your team that's likely to make it out the East? Um, Give me your top two. Top two? Out the East. Mm-hmm. I go with the Bucks and the probably the Heat. Mm-hmm. Both of those teams before the Celtics. Yeah, I'd say so because the Cavs. I, I don't trust. I don't think they're gonna go far. The Knicks. Julius Randle's still out. Oh, 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 okay, yeah, but the topic at hand is the the Celtics and the fact that you have the Heat and the Bucks over the Celtics. So, what have you seen out of both of those teams to the point where you're like, oh yeah, head and shoulders more likely to make it out of the East over the Celtics? Well, I mean, the reason why I like the Bucks so much is because they got three. Stars. I mean, they have really a great bench unit. I mean, I know they struggled early on, and they don't have the record to support that. But I mean, even yesterday when they they had Bobby Porter's with thirty, Dane with thirty five, and Milton who just came off after like two months of not playing, he had twenty two with that, and they beat it's the Suns 
without Giannis. That, that that to me is like a big statement win. Like and that's why I have the Bucks over someone like the Celtics because they have a they have a a great coach who's won a championship ring. I know he hasn't had the playoff success in like an entire decade, but still he's had the playoff success and he has a ring to his name. And they got Dame and they got Giannis. That's a great combo. Dame can be the shooter, Giannis can be the roller. And they got Brooke Lopez still, and Bobby Portis. They have a great all around team. You know, I don't really I see that with the Celtics, but the bench isn't really like what you said, their bench kinda they don't their bench is kinda iffy, but I like the Bucks bench more so than the Celtics bench. And the fact that Giannis has done it before. And I know that Giannis isn't isn't gonna sell for the reason to attack the rim. I, and their, their their team is more so around. They have, I mean, I think they've been playing the, like their top ten in defense. I think after the All Star break, so it's not like they've been playing like bad defense. So I think they figure it, figuring it out. So that's why I have the Bucks ahead of the Celtics. And the Heat for me is just for like a more so like a personal. It's not really, it's not really what they've done this season. I'm just going based off what they did in the playoffs, you know. So I think. Yeah, that's, that's for me, though. I, I don't know. All right. Um, let's get into our next topic. How about let's get into the Timberwolves? Um, so, Cat's injured, and Anthony Edwards is trying to lead the team on his own. He actually had one of the craziest blocks I've ever seen against Indy recently. Game-saving, or regular season, I guess, block. Um, but... It's really with the cat injury and going forward, uh, let's say cat's not there next year or something like that. Uh, can Anthony Edwards lead this team? And really, I'm talking more so this year. Um, if you want to get into next year, that's fine. You don't have to. I was just throwing it out there. But yeah, can cat or can uh, Anthony Ant Man uh, lead this team right now? Uh, let's go with uh, Brent. Um, what, what do you mean lead this team to what? Like, how far are you saying? Um, I don't know. We didn't really get into it. that. Was the <laughs> I think question. it was just up to your discretion as to where where do you think he can lead them? Um, he could probably lead into like a first round, but I don't know if he could get past the second round because Cat Cat gives them that spacing that they that Anthony Edwards needs, and I think in the playoffs, where you go, Barry, they're gonna expose him like they did in Utah. So I don't really. If they go small, say if the other team goes small, that's going to weaken the Minnesota's defense. They're going to take Gobert out, which is going to make the defense really not as what it is um, right now. And with Cat out, you know, that gives you more spacing, you know. I think Nas Reed is a good replacement, though, because he basically can do everything that Cat can do. Maybe even a little – nah, he's not not a bad shooter, but he's, he's damn he's, – he's really close. He's a good player, but I think – the, the furthest he can lead him is to the first round. And probably if next year, if Cat's healthy and stuff, uh, maybe it's like the second round, you know. But it's going to take a couple years for him to get to that. Okay. To get the team to, like, contender-wise, you know. They still need, like, I need a, like another solid player on their team. What about you, Ryan? I agree with, with almost, like, well, pretty much all that you're saying. Um... The first round, I think they're really susceptible to an upset. I think they're at the three seed right now. We'll face a six seed, and I think the teams in that range, you're talking Sac, Dallas, and Phoenix, and particularly Dallas and Phoenix, teams with lethal offensive superstars and solid coaches in Frank Vogel and Jason Kidd. You were talking about how Rudy Gobert got schemed out of team defenses in Utah, yeah. how teams went small against them. Dallas, literally, I think it was, was it Dallas? It might be a, another no, It was team. Dallas that exposed them I the f- first round. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was Dallas like two years ago. <laughs> they went small against Utah, and they, they knocked them out in the first round. They went small with probably Maxi Kleba. He's still there, and, and he's had a bounce back second half of the season. Um, but, yeah, my point is those teams are – they might not exploit Rudy Gobert, but they're they're gonna make him not as impactful because they will space him out, and especially given how much Minnesota has leaned on their defense this season, him like you said, him not being as impactful defensively hinders them. 
and them not having Cat, they won't have the offensive firepower to keep up with the likes of Luka and Kyrie, who are going to get you combined 50 points per game at least. Same with Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. So for that reason, I think they are susceptible to a first-round exit. And if Anthony Edwards can somehow drag this team past uh, either of those teams, I think it would be an incredible feat for him. Um, I don't think we're going to look at him losing in five or six games to either of those teams and really criticize him for it uh, this season. As for next season, I'm not really sure because, Joe, like you hinted at, there are whispers here and there that Cat might be on his way out. And I think, if anything, this potential first-round playoff series can serve as kind of like a litmus test to see what Anthony Edwards can do in a high-pressure like playoff situation without Cat. And we can gauge if Anthony Edwards needs another offensive superstar to the caliber of Carl Anthony Towns next to him, or if Minnesota can better diversify that money elsewhere because he is making a lot of money because he got a super max extension that, that I think kicks in this next upcoming season. So um, that's going to be the real reason why I pay attention to this first round playoff series for him. Agreed. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's, I think that, that you guys hit it on the head right there just because, I mean, we really don't know. It's all speculation on what will, will, will come going forward. I have the belief in Anthony Edwards, but at this point we, it's only belief. It's, that's all it is. So, but I, I mean, he has it in him, I think. It's just a matter of if he can get it done. Uh, let's move on to, uh, let's see, what should we go to next? Before we before we move on, I kind of want to give a comparison. Do you remember the the COVID playoffs where Luka took on the, the Clippers? Yeah. And I think he, he forced that six or seven. I think it will kind of be a similar feel if Anthony Edwards has kind of a, a similar performance. Like a breakout against the team with yeah kind of like a breakout and he loses in six or seven but he's dropping like 35 a game and has heroic performances like that i think we'll look at it in that same type of light of luca versus the clippers let's say it's ant versus phoenix or something like that right. we could only hope for something like that. that would be so fun to watch if i could go back Indeed. to tw- that 2020 bubble was so fun to watch maybe because we were secluded stuck, stuck in. but it was damn fun dude <laughs> Uh, but anyway, let's let's move on. Uh, let's let's go back into the Lakers uh, or LeBron. <clears throat> it's gonna not be LeBron. It's I mean it is LeBron, but the Lakers Warriors. Uh, we were talking about them a bit. We put them in the contenders pretenders just because they're they're teetering on the edge and they they both got those two guys. Um, who should be more concerned right now, the Lakers or the Warriors? Um, when it comes to making the playoffs or the play in. Um, and let's, I know we were just talking with you, Ryan. Uh, let's, let's go to you. Let, let's go back to you, though. For me, I think this is a pretty easy one. The Lakers should be more concerned for a couple of reasons. The Warriors, they currently have the tiebreaker. They're 2 and 1 against the Lakers with one more game to play. I think it might be at the end of this month or early April. Um, but as of right now, the Warriors have the tiebreaker over them, and I don't think there's a way that either team makes it into the definitive playoff picture. I think they're too far gone from that um, potential six seed. They're definitely going to be in that seven to ten range, and it's going to be closer to nine or ten. I think they're guaranteed to be ninth or tenth, uh, both of them. So both teams are going to have one game. If they lose one game, they're out because they'll be facing each other in the 9-10 spot. So that kind of lessens both teams' chances of making the playoffs. But comparing the two teams, I give the Warriors the advantage because with that hypothetical tiebreaker, the Warriors would have the home court advantage if they faced each other in the playing tournament um, just off of that. And then team-wise, I think the Lakers are, sorry, I think the Warriors are a bit more consistent personnel wise the only real reason the warriors are in this range is 
due to the amount of time that their top guys have missed. Like Draymond having that 20 game. I think it was. Wait, no, no. John Morant had a 20 game suspension. Draymond was suspended indefinitely, but it might have been like 10 to 15 games or so. Um, that was a significant stretch. CP3, he was out, I think, a couple of significant stretches throughout the season, and he's only just getting back. So that's really the sole reason why the Warriors' record is as bad or as mid as it is now. Other than that, I think they're just a better team. Obviously, the Lakers have the better top two in AD and and Braun, but team-wise, I think the Warriors are deeper. They have a lot more guys that they can rely on. The emergence of Jonathan Kuminga, obviously D'Lo has emerged for the Lakers, but D'Lo's emergence is... I think more so short term because whenever he has a 36 point game and he's hitting clutch threes, he's very susceptible to the very next game having a a 2 for 11 output. And I think Kuminga has been a lot more reliable as Steve Kerr has put him into the starting lineup. And also defensively, I think the Warriors are more capable. Um, Since the All-Star break, the Lakers are 29th in defensive rating while the Warriors are 5th. so for those reasons, I got the Warriors as more, or sorry, the Lakers more concerned about making the players playoffs or playing. Mm-hmm. I would say for me personally, I, I have to agree with you. I feel like the Lakers are more, they're more, <clears throat> I think they should be more concerned compared to the Warriors. I mean, I feel like the Warriors are figuring out after the All-Star break compared to the Lakers who have taken a step back after the All-Star break. For some, whatever reason that is, I don't know why, but they they haven't they haven't been competing after the All Star break, um and like kind of was just Ryan going based off of Ryan instead. Um, the Warriors do have like a a more efficient bench I feel like, and I trust I trust I mean I trust the Warriors more so than the Lakers because AD even though he's been playing great this year, like the past five to ten games he hasn't really been playing well. And LeBron is almost damn near 40, so we don't know how much he's going to have in the tank in the playoffs, or if, even if they make the playoffs. So it's really tough to really say who's going to go further. But I would say the Warriors are more – I think they'd make the playoffs compared to the Lakers, and the Lakers should be more concerned because there's only like 16 games left. There's not a lot of time left. And Brian made a great point with saying D'Angelo. It's not – this isn't like a – for the whole season type thing. Like, he's 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 going to come and go like he did last year in the playoffs. So, I don't really – I can't really hold T- D'Angelo Russell as, like, he's going to come through in the playoffs compared to, like, someone like Brown and AD and Austin Reeves. So, I would say the Warriors – I think the Lakers should be more concerned from where they're at right now with playing the worst defense they've been playing, 29th, like Ryan said. And with Darvin Ham, questions about his future rising – who knows if that's, who that's going to play a factor in the playoffs if they make the playoffs. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of how consistent they can be before the playoffs come around. Yeah. If they can stay in a groove, I think both of them have a real chance of making a, a good playoff run. But it's just it's just about the flow state they're in, I guess, before they get in there. One of them's going to be out, man. They're, they're too far behind the eighth seed to, to ascend past that. They're both, um, I think both teams are tied in record right now, Mm -hmm. but the Warriors have the tiebreaker, but they're both three games behind the Suns at eight. So they're destined to face each other in the play-in tournament, so one of those teams is going to be out for sure. Yeah, so let's see where they're at. The Lakers are tied, yeah. The Lakers have one win, but they've played two extra games. So they're one win, one loss. Yeah, they're tied. Um, 10 and 9. And then trailing is Houston and the Jazz at 32 wins and then 29 wins. Yeah, they're not catching up. <laughs> yeah, I doubt and that. The, the NBA is going to make sure a, a Warriors Lakers play in happens before a, a Utah <laughs> a Utah Lakers. Play. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's move on. Uh, we've got three more topics probably, some around there to get into. Um, so th- let's let's start off with this first one. Uh, it's going to be OKC versus the Spurs just happened, uh, not too, I I can't remember the exact date, but they just played, and Wemby uh, really took it to Chet, he, 
I think Wemby took 15 shots in isolations versus Chet or something like that, and Chet took six, like as in a total, um, six, four or six or something like that. Um, there, there's something about <laughs> watching them face off. You kind of like the dog in a, for me personally in Wemby, uh, but we're, we're part of the reason why we're seeing this from Wemby probably is the rookie of the year because he was so far out of it for a while with how t- bad their team has been. And I mean, uh, Chet's probably the second best player on what the second best team in the West right now, the first best team in the West. So, um. You know, there's there's some arguments there for the rookie of the year. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you guys are gonna agree or disagree on this because I know people are kind of in the middle a little bit. Um, but yeah, let's hear it. Let's start with you, Brent. What are you asking? Who's your rookie of the year? Oh, and I, let's go into the game. I mean, did that move the needle for you, the OKC versus Spurs? Um, not really, cause I I think. I'm just going based off what I've seen from Chet the whole – I mean, uh, Wemby the whole season. Um, that okay. game, though, was like icing on the top because during that time there was discussion about Chet. Should he be in the conversation? And after that game happened, <clears throat> say goodbye. He was out of the conversation. He got blocked by Wemby in the last possession in a clutch moment. And I just think it's it's really – to me, it's like an easy, an easy award to give out to Wemby. He's been the best player – on his team, the best defensive player you can make an argument out of the league. And I would have to just give it to Wimby. The only thing that I, you d- I, I would agree with is the, his record. I don't think they should be 15 in the West. Like, where you got all-star talent, uh, all-star talent like that, generational talent, I think you should be somewhat better than the 15 spot. That's my opinion. But I, I have – he's head above shoulders of Chet. I mean, Chet doesn't show up. He isn't the main guy on this team. You got Shea over there and Jalen Williams and other great players who take the pressure away from him. When Wemby, Wemby's the only player they have at the Spurs. He's the only star player on that team. So there's, there's going to be more on his shoulders than compared to Shea. So I would say Wemby, it's easy. It's, it's him for the rookie of the year. What about you, Ryan? I'm going to start out by saying... Uh-oh. The only thing that I disagree with you about, because everything else I agree with you wholeheartedly about, Bryant, but the only thing I disagree with you about is you expecting Wimby to lead the Spurs team to more than their win total right now. Like, this Spurs team is ass. <laughs> ass. Complete ass. I think you, you could throw um, throw De'Aaron Fox on this team. I think they're still going to be bad. Mm. I think... That's a that's a good kind of a similar uh, replacement player for given how impactful Wimby is and how impactful Fox is borderline all stars this season. Um, I think the Spurs would still be a sub twenty win team. So I think you're kind of expecting too much of of Wimby to. What are you What are you expecting him to lead them to thirty wins on the season? At least not. I don't expect them to be the fifteen. Like that's that's to me is like a little shocking. And they didn't they lose like fifteen or fifteen games in a row. That that shit. Yeah. Well, Jeremy Sohan was point guard for twenty games. So. Yeah. Yeah. He never played point guard in his life. I don't know why he is, but that's a different story for a different day. So I don't blame the first twenty necessarily. <laughs> and every win they've gotten has been off the back of. Victor. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to delve too much into that because that's not the topic. But that's just the only thing I disagree with you about. Everything else, you're spot on about the rookie of the year. There's just there's been this whole discourse about um, the two arguments for the two: Chet being on a winning team and having a very solid output, and and Wemby trying to drag the Spurs team with every ounce of energy he has to just being respectable. The rookie of the year has never been a team award. MVP, you kind of look you have to look at what the team is doing mm-hmm. because it's to some degree it isn't a, a team award. You're not really you've never gotten an MVP on a team that's been outside the playoffs. I think the lowest seeded team for an MVP has been Russell Westbrook in that inaugural or not inaugural. I think the the second year anybody has ever averaged the, a triple double. Yeah. And I think Jokic, his first MVP, the Nuggets were like a fifth seed, but that was because he was having 
the most efficient offensive output that any player has had. So those were two anomalies. Yep. But other than that, MVP has always gone to a team, the player on a team, at least in the top three in their respective conference. Rookie of the year, you're expecting teams to be shitty. So it's never been a an expectation on a, a rookie having an impact on winning. You've always looked at individual output. And Wemby's has been far above Chet's. Chet has been the second best rookie by far. Or not by far. I think Brandon Miller deserves some love in the rookie of the year race because he has been really good, but he just doesn't have the eyes on him. But I think Wemby is in a tier of his own in the rookie of the year because, like Brian said, he's also in defensive player of the year consideration. Yeah, we'll get into that. um, We'll get into that. We'll get into that, but for those reasons, it, it has to be Wemby. I think if... Oh, and speaking on the game itself, because of how dominant Wemby was, I don't think it served as anything more than just a cherry on top, like Brian said. But if Chet were to have a head-turning game, I think it would have made me think twice about it, but I still would give Wemby the edge because of the overall season output yeah. uh, individually from him. It's kind of weird because Wemby, Wemby had everything to lose, and Chet was already kind of out of it going into that, so... I mean, he had just something yeah, to gain. That's from a good it. way of putting it. Um, but okay, let's just just because you mentioned the defensive player of the year, um, let's get into that. Uh, so we were just talking about how rookie of the year is more of an individual award, MVP is more of a team award, and I think defense of the player of the year kind of lies in both those categories, maybe leaning more into the team. Um, with uh, barring anomalies, you know what I mean? Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to ask right now, more or less, is the anomaly of what Victor is defensively gonna g- giving you giving him the edge defensive player of the year wise over what uh, Rudy Gobert is doing in in Minnesota. Um. So who's our defensive player of the year? Let's start with uh, Ryan. I test um, Wemby is the best defensive player in the league. Easily. The the shit that he's doing, the amount of court that he's able to cover, it's it's insane and it's it kind of serves as a, a good preview of what his career has the potential to be. Um, just talking about the defensive end. Um, but the defensive player of the year, it's going to be Rudy Gobert because of the team, the team impact. And Chris Finch has done a really good job in terms of funneling. This is what Utah did for eight years, funneling everything to the paint, getting over screens as much as possible and making sure every shot attempt is coming or as many shot attempts are coming with Rudy Gobert contesting or blocking. And we can't really discredit Rudy Gobert for for playing his job to perfection right um you know that it's this it's the scheme really and I think because defensive player of the year is somewhat of a team award Rudy has to be rewarded for that so I think he is going to be the defensive player of the year it's going to be his third or fourth yeah let's find out or not which is it's it's crazy to say that out loud but I think it's his fourth um it really just it, it might be but it really just speaks to how well Chris Finch has um, schemed his defense around Rudy Go- Gobert this year and how well uh, Minnesota has been at funneling everything to the paint, getting over screens. I think they, they don't really give up a lot of threes. They probably give a, probably like the second or third least amount of threes per game team-wide. It just serves as a, uh, a measurement of their team defensive scheme. But individually, I think... Wemby is a better defensive player, of uh, just a more capable defensive player because he can switch out and cover a bit more ground, and he's more mobile than Rudy. But it, the winner is going to be Rudy for sure. Yeah, I would have to agree with Ryan. I mean, whew, Wemby's a god on defense. I'm sorry, but I think a lot of it has to do with team success, and sadly, his defense isn't really showing up as a team record. I mean, they got 15 wins right now compared to. Uh, like forty something. Yeah, around that's a big difference. But I, I would say on paper it's Rudy. But if you watch the game, it's it's 
easily Victor. It's no offense to Rudy because he's a good defensive player, but there's easy there's easy ways to expose him, you know. And there's, there's not I don't think there's that many ways you can expose Webb because he can even guard the perimeter because of his length. But I would have to give it to Rudy. Uh, he's gonna win. I think his fourth or third. That's so fun. yeah. So Rudy Rudy has th- has three. His yeah. first was in 2018. So if he wins four, he's won four and seven. That's ridiculous. Yeah, but... let's, let's give him some props with that fucking <laughs> jank ass slap on the water bottle. <laughs> we'll give him some props. Oh yeah, but because <laughs> we we know Shaq is gonna hate on it yeah, when he for wins. Real. Shaq what? doesn't like his ass. But yeah. hey, hey, Rudy believes he could guard Shaq one on one. Oh God! You lock him up. <laughs> you get killed. But anyway, Bryant, sorry. No, you good. Um, but yeah, I have to give it to Rudy Gobert. Well, for sure next year, I I think he for sure won it, or well, he'd be in the discussion for it right now, or uh, that for next year. But yeah, I have it. Give it to Rudy just for team success, basically. Okay, we're gonna go back to you right now, Bryant. Um, oh. so this next one we're gonna get into. Uh, we've done defense of the player, defensive player of the year. We've done rookie of the year. All we have left is MVP. I know we went into the face of the league uh, in the last podcast, but this is a bit of a different topic because the face isn't always uh, the best player. It's kind of a mix of best player and you know the the way you handle yourself off the court as well. Mm. Um, but the MVP this year, um, it's kind of a race between Shea and and Jokic and depending on how good the Mavericks can play the the remainder of the season get a few more wins maybe Luka um and that's kind of like a dark horse but where are you guys on the MVP and like I said we're going to start with you Brent um I don't think Luka has a chance of winning it it's no offense but it's just his team is like Nah, I see no way of winning of him winning it, especially when Jokic and Shea's playing that good right now. If I had to give it an MVP pick, I'd give it to Shea. And it's more so just of his outbreak compared to Jokic. I feel like he had he has more of an impact on the offensive end compared to Jokic. Jokic, of course, gets everyone involved, but he has Jamal Murray to take off the pressure when he doesn't really have like a a second super, a second star on his team. I mean. I don't. I don't think Jalen Williams is a star yet. I don't think um, Chad's a star yet. They have good players, but they don't have a star like Jamal Jamal Murray. And I think Shea's impact, like he's, they're the first seed right now. I don't think no one expected them to be this good. You know, I don't think no, no one expected them to be this good at this point of season. And the, yeah. they're just coasting at this point. I mean, they know what they have to do. They're the second seed, and it's no offense to Jokic or anything, but they they. I feel like they just they're gonna wait till the playoffs. They're not taking it they're not taking the season as serious compared to like someone like OKC and this still the second seed. But I mean, I, just look at how many how many games they're down twenty going into the fucking late third, fourth. I know it's ridiculous. <laughs> but like they turn it up when they have to only. It, it's ridiculous. Especially when they when they beat Boston too. That was a big win. But I, I would have to give the Shea. I feel like just his impact and from what I've seen on some games with him playing, like he can get to a spot whenever he wants. He can get everyone involved. And he plays on the defensive side of the ball too. He gets steals and blocks. So I have to give it to Shea. And it's no offense to Yoki. She's playing great, but I'd say Shea has the Shea has the advantage right now. What about you, Ryan? I Uh-oh. Ooh man. I don't know. I'm still teetering on this, but the thing with this MVP race is there's a bit of recency bias with every recent with, with every MVP race and whenever a player goes on a, like a a definitive headlining like final stretch of dominance that kind of can be the deciding factor of who wins MVP. Right now the the Nuggets are the best team in the league since the All-Star break and they've had quite a few prominent games on on national television where Jokic has has been dominant um so for that reason i i think if if he rides this momentum and the nuggets continue to be on top of the world and and get the one seed i think Jokic is gonna get it but in my personal opinion i think i would give it to shea gilgis as well because 
OKC is in that top two range and their team, in my opinion, is not as good as Denver's team. So I think he does have a bit more onus of offensive creation on his shoulders. So I think I would give it to, to SGA, but in my opinion, it's, it's a toss-up. If you give it to Shea, it wouldn't really make me bat an eye. If you, if you gave it to Jokic, it wouldn't make me bat an eye either. It's definitely between those two, though. Luka probably doesn't have a chance because of how how low Dallas is and right. and how good Jokic and, and SGA are playing, honestly. Yeah, it really just for them it'd be a matter they'd have to win like something ridiculous, like nine out of ten games, go on some yeah. crazy run. Yeah, I agree. That's that's really why I mentioned he's because I know he's been in the talks a little bit, just how good he's been playing individually. But like I said before, like we've talked about, it's a it's a team success award. So yeah, I agree. I think Giannis would probably be higher than, than Luca. I think so. Yeah, there's as critical as I've been of the Bucks, and despite of all their defensive turmoil and head coaching turnover, they've still fucking somehow gotten second in the Eastern Conference. So, gotta give credit where credit's due. Yeah, and Giannis is quietly having an elite, elite season. I think statistically, it's one of his best seasons. Um, but it's kind of been thrown under the rug because of how much uh, distractions there have been with the Milwaukee Bucks team. Yeah, he's averaging 30.8 points, 11 rebounds, and 6 assists on 61% shooting, and that's 7th in the league. He's doing really good. 3rd in the league on points. So, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, All right, so let's let's wrap it up then. I think we got into quite a bit, just under an hour, I think. Yeah, Um, I appreciate uh, all the support we do appreciate all the support um like i said it's it's mainly been friends and probably some of uh ryan's ib listeners or viewers uh but yeah if you guys have anything uh maybe topics even i mean if we get any comments on the topic we'd be we'd be more than willing to get into it um i think we did a we did a good episode this uh today anything else you guys uh felt like getting into um maybe no i think it's okay wrap it up here yeah. All right then. I think we're good there. All right, appreciate it. Oh, and then and to get into the, because uh, I know we we were trying to have a two week schedule, we're gonna try to s- stick to that, um, and we might just end up going from here, or maybe we get another upload soon because this was a short one, and we can get something, uh, something with a little a little more recent up. So, um, anyway, without further ado, thank you. To Brian and Ryan, my hosts or my stars. Uh, this is, I'm Joseph, and we'll we'll catch you guys. Peace. Peace. Thank you for listening. Peace.